Welcome everyone to the Narkey Street Congregation's July 11th, 2020 online service. My name is Gary Alley. I'm Danny Kopp. Uh, it's good to be with you guys this morning. And we're, we've entered the summer months here in Israel. And we actually haven't met online for three weeks, I think it is, Danny. Yeah, and but here we are back again, because <laughs> we've hit a second wave. And um, we had restrictions even when we met these last three weeks, where we had to wear masks and keep a two meter distance um, from each other. And we weren't allowed to go over 50. Um, but now that the wave is um, gotten intense, um, restrictions are back at uh, 19 or 20 um, maximum that um, uh, religious services are allowed to have. So we decided it would just be um, safer and better to, to go back online and um, do something more of a hybrid where maybe we can meet in smaller groups in homes, um, but then also do something online where we could watch maybe have um, a discussion of um, um, of the message that's brought. So maybe you talk yeah. about what we're going to do. Yeah, I think the idea is that we're going to break into groups that are small at home on Shabbat morning here in Jerusalem, and there would be time for prayer, worship together. Then the groups would watch the message for that week, which for the summer, we're going to have a plan to try to focus the message to about 20 to 25 minutes. And it would be based on our readings from the Bible, which are based on the parasha. So the Narki Street Bible readings. So this week we have Kevin Grasso leading us. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's nice doing these doing these readings like we do during the service you feel like you're connected to what's going on in the land and um it's it's cool to be able to do um to be able to still stay connected in this way um um be able to hear the service and then but then also be able to discuss it in our groups um and be a little bit more feel a little bit more like a community so that we're not just only online it's been hard to know how to how to handle all of this upheaval as we go through this. Like, do we only go online? Do we try to meet? Um, how do you stay safe? And how do we maintain our our community? Because obviously, um, we'll shrivel up if we don't um, if we don't stay together in in some way. And um, and we we need each other at the end of the day. Um, and we've, um, we felt it when we came back uh, together as a body and as Shabbat. Um, it was, um, it was really great to, to see everybody that was able to come. And I know a lot of people, even, even that weren't able to come. Um, so uh, we missed all of you who weren't able to come. We understand all the reasons why um, certain people aren't. And that's totally um, makes sense. Um, but, um, um, we, we need to be able to continue to reach out to each other and be a community. Um, so let us hear from you guys, uh, those of you who aren't able to come, um, let us know what you think and, um, stay in touch. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. I think for us to really keep that contact between one another so really do if you're watching this and you're in jerusalem or even if you're outside of jerusalem just let us know how you're doing and um we always appreciate input and if you have any prayer requests we still have the prayer group won't be meeting this coming wednesday because of um the increased increasing of restrictions but they're still praying and there's still those of us praying here. So let's just stay in contact 
and uh, not forsake that connection because this this thing you know i have to admit i i felt like things were gonna maybe get better sooner quicker and back in march it was like okay we're gonna do this a couple months and then things are just gonna get better that's at least my my mental thoughts and now it doesn't look like um it's gonna happen in well who knows when exactly it's there's just everything is a bunch of theories really so we're really gonna be doing some hard work to reimagine what the church looks like in times when you know you can't necessarily touch or even be together in really intimate groups of worship and prayer and so we're just gonna be trusting the lord in this whole time and and he's got a plan and we're going to come out of this on the other side for the better so maybe uh we should just open in prayer and then we'll uh listen to the word from kevin lord thank you for uh, bringing us all here at this moment in history and even just in our mundane lives um where there's lots of questions and concerns and fears. And we just bring these, these anxieties or just responsibilities to you and just ask that you would um, cover them with your grace right now in each one of our lives so that we can put our trust in you and know that you are in control of each one of our lives. And we love you, Lord. We ask that you would speak to us now, wherever we are, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, bechol levavcha, ubechol nafshecha, ubechol meodecha. Ve'hayu hadvarim ha'ele, asher anochi metzavecha hayom, Alevavecha, <laughs> My name is Kevin Grosso, and I will be doing the sermon slash extended parasha for this week. So since it's extended, what I thought it would do is start in Genesis and work our way up to Numbers 25, which is the actual parasha for this week. So we won't actually look in detail at all the things going on in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, but I thought it would be helpful for us to focus on a couple of big themes um, found in the Torah that can help us to situate where we are in the bigger story. So I think it's very easy when we read the parasha each week to kind of forget where we are. So hopefully this will help us in the coming weeks as we look at the parasha in more depth to figure out where we are in the story. So the two big things I want to focus on are God revealing himself to humanity progressively, and how God uses humanity in his plan. So we'll just start out with Genesis 1, um, where everything God created was good and a reflection of his perfection. 
and the greatest reflection of his perfection was man. And man was to be an image bearer to show the whole world what God was like by reflecting his character over the face of the earth and reflecting it in a unique way. The birds and the animals and the plants and everything in creation reflects God's character, but, but only man can do it in a unique way, in really showing the world the character of God. And so God commands humanity from the very beginning to not eat the fruit, showing that he is a God of justice and righteousness and cares about what we do. But as we all know, man disobeys and fails to reflect God. And this starts God's recreation process, whereby he restores goodness back into creation. So then we move on to chapters 4 through 11. So corruption ensues until the flood, when God concludes that he must recreate all of humanity except for Noah. He says, everyone's intentions are evil from birth. I'm going to start all over with Noah. And Noah is recommissioned to spread God's image, just like Adam was. But he also fails in a garden after he gets drunk, showing that man's fundamental flaw is still present. This culminates, this rebellion, in the Tower of Babel, when humans directly violate God's commission. Instead of building a name for God throughout the world, they congregate in one place and attempt to build a name for themselves. So this is the backdrop to the calling of Abraham in Genesis 12. So God begins with Abraham to implement a new solution to the problem. He chooses one man, Abraham, to reveal himself more fully and intimately to, and appears to him multiple times. And Abraham, his role in the story, he is promised that the whole world will be blessed through his offspring. And the rest of Genesis is, tells this story, the building of the nation that God has chosen through this one man. So God continues to appear in special ways to Isaac and Jacob, granting visions and special guidance. And Jacob becomes Israel and the father of the 12 tribes, which starts to form the nation of Israel. And then we have Exodus. So in the beginning of Exodus, God allows Israel to be enslaved for 400 years by the Egyptians and reveals himself in a new way through this to humanity. Here we learn that God is a redeemer and cares for the oppressed in a special way. I mean, if you think about this, before, before the events happened in the Exodus, mankind did not know that God cared for slaves and the oppressed in a particular way. They didn't know really that God was a redeemer in that way. And so this is an opportunity for God to show his character. So the time in Egypt for humanity, for Israel, right, acts as an incubator for the 12 tribes and they multiply greatly. So that's their part of the story in the beginning of Exodus. And then we move on to the, the plagues. So the plagues systematically pit Yahweh, Israel's God, against the gods of the Egyptians. And it is Israel's God that proves himself to be more powerful than the most powerful nation on earth at the time. At the same time, Israel, right, the descendants of Israel recognize Yahweh as their God for the first time on a large scale. Again, people didn't understand until this point how God had chosen, Israel's God had chosen Israel for a unique purpose. They had some idea of it through Abraham, but they didn't really understand it fully. And then after the exodus out of Egypt, God appears to Israel and Moses in a more dramatic and intimate way on Mount Sinai than ever before. He reveals his glory in a new way to humanity. 
And the entire nation is given a glimpse into God's plan in Exodus 19, that he started in Abraham to bless the world. The nation is to be an entire kingdom of priests, an intermediary nation between the world and God. So this would be how God would bless the world through Abraham. And then at Sinai, we have the giving of the law. The giving of the law represents the most comprehensive revelation of God's justice given to humanity up until this point. So now people have a greater view of God's righteousness than ever before. So that begins in Exodus 20. But despite this, even the closest humans to God are still shown to be evil when they worship the golden calf in Exodus 32, almost immediately after being given the greatest revelation they've ever been given. In other words, man still does not love God or see his goodness as he ought. There's still a fundamental problem. And then, towards the end of Exodus, we finally have God beginning to dwell with man when the glory fills the tabernacle at the very end of Exodus. And this is a momentous moment for the nation of Israel. Again, God had never dwelt with a people like this before in history, since, since the Garden of Eden, right, when he would walk with Adam in the garden. And the nation of Israel as a whole is now closer to God than ever before. And it isn't just one man like Moses that now has access to God. It is the entire nation. And of course, there's, there's a, a method to this, right? You have to go through the priesthood. But it's still the entire nation has this closeness, this intimacy with God that has never been experienced before. And then we have Leviticus. So Leviticus is in some ways a very large parenthesis in this storyline. It is mostly a list of laws dealing with the most fundamental problem of Israel. How is a nation of sinners going to be a kingdom of priests to the world? Or in other words, how would God display his holiness in and through Israel who is fundamentally broken? And so, so many of these laws are actually designed to show God's holiness, right, through Israel's brokenness. So we see God's opposition to sin and death throughout the book. In various ways, the law deals with sin and its consequences. Again, further revealing God's intense desire for Israel and through them, all of humanity, to be like him in every way to be image bearers, to be people who show his character to the world. And so after this large parenthesis of Leviticus, right, where the story really doesn't progress very much, there's a couple places where it does, but it really doesn't progress very much until we get to Numbers. And Numbers picks up the story where Exodus, the end of Exodus, left off, right? The people have now been equipped with the law they need to be a nation of priests. And they are ready to enter the land God promised to Abraham, where they will hopefully be able to display God to the world, as they were originally created to do. So we see in the initial chapters of Numbers this census. And the initial census has a dual purpose. So first of all, all the men are counted age 20 and above. And this isn't just, you know, uh, a biblical example of sexism, right? This is actually designed to count who you have that can fight the battle right before you're about to go into the promised land, right? So it's taking stock of the size of Israel's army. And it simultaneously will help to determine the size of the land of each tribe and family that they will receive when they enter the land after they conquer the, the nations there. So the project to display God's holiness to the world in the land of promise is imminent 
at the beginning of Numbers. We're about to enter the land and we're about to begin to display God to the world and be a kingdom of priests like we were called to be. That's the idea. But then we have a series of rebellions. And really the series of rebellions started in Exodus, and you can see it a, bit, a little in Leviticus, and then it culminates in Numbers. And it culminates in Numbers, specifically in Numbers 14, with the people refusing to enter the land out of fear. So the same people who witnessed Yahweh defeat the gods of Egypt, one of the most powerful nations on earth at the time, do not trust him to fight for them as they enter the promised land. So God makes another promise to them that this generation will not see the land except those who trusted in him. So we know who was in that generation because they just took a census, right? There are 603,550 men above 20 that left Egypt. And only two of these, Caleb and Joshua, will enter the land. So that's Exodus or Numbers 14. And then in Numbers 15, starting in Numbers 15, we see God keeping his promise. We see that God doesn't only keep the promises that he makes that are good, but he also keeps the promises that he makes that are bad. He promised that the people would not inherit the land, and they don't. He says, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And during this time, more rebellions follow, showing that, again, humanity's fundamental problem that we saw with Adam and Eve in the garden, that we saw with Noah in his garden, the Tower of Babel, that you can see in the patriarchs, and that you can see in Exodus and Leviticus, this fundamental problem of man's rebellion against God still persists. Even though we've been given so many opportunities and so much grace in the law to obey God, we still fail. So the people are punished for the rebellions and the unfaithful generation is eventually killed off in the wilderness. And then we come to Balaam's oracle, right? In beginning in chapter 22 of Numbers. And after Balaam's oracle gives further revelation about God will bless Israel and the world through Israel, the last great rebellion is when the men commit sexual immorality with the Moabite women and begin to worship their gods. And it is stopped by the zeal of Phineas, who reflects God's desire for holiness by killing a perpetrator who is flaunting his disobedience. And so that concludes the introduction to today's parasha. So we're now ready to begin with the conclusion of the final great rebellion against God and Moses that would lead to the death of the entire unfaithful generation that came out of Egypt, who would not receive the land promised to them, and who would not get to participate in God's plan of reconciling the world to himself through his people. So we start in Numbers 25, 10 through 19. So what we're going to do is just look at a couple of key verses in these chunks, and we're going to ask two questions. The first question is, how, how does this section fit into the larger story? And the second section is, what does this have to do with us? Like, why does this matter to us now? So, so first, we have the account of the covenant made with Phineas. So again, this is right after Phineas killed the, the man who was committing sexual immorality um, with the Moabite woman, right? And the bigger problem was that they were actually worshiping their gods. And this is what God says to Moses. Phineas, son of Eliezer, this is starting in verse 11.
Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, since he was as zealous for my honor among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore, tell him, I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood, because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. So in other words, Phineas is a reflection of God's righteous anger against sin. And that is what turns God's anger away from the people. Phineas is, is doing exactly what God created him to do. He is reflecting God's character to the world. In this case, to Israel, to the community um, that Phineas was in, right? And this tells us something, obviously, about, about God and what God thinks about sin that he hates it. And this is something that we often don't really talk about very much. We, we will say, but we don't reflect on it, that God really does hate sin. And, and really he has to, and it's good that he does because he hates the world not being the way it should be. He hates it when people don't love as they ought to love and don't show mercy and grace as they ought to show mercy and grace and don't obey him as they ought to obey him. And so it's understandable that he hates it. And, and what we learn from Phineas is that we should also hate it. So, so what does this have to do with us? In order for us to reflect God like Phineas in the way that we were designed to do, we have to hate sin. We have to hate it with a passion. It is not bad to hate in the world. We should hate some things because some things are worth hating. And the one thing that we should hate more than anything else is first and foremost, the sin found in ourselves. And we should have no mercy in our battle against the sin found within us. And it's a struggle that we all have to face every single day, day in and day out. We're going to have to get up tomorrow and even the rest of this day. We have to fight against evil thoughts that arise within us. But this is what we were created to do. We were created to reflect God in this way, reflect God's anger against sin in this way by fighting our sinful tendencies that arise within us. So then we move on to Numbers 26. And Numbers 26 is the census. And again, you can read the census, right, and miss the point within the larger story. So how does this fit into the story? So we'll start by reading the end of the census to get an idea. So this is Numbers 26, starting in 63. These are the ones counted by Moses and Eleazar, the priest, when they counted the Israelites on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. Not one of them was among those counted by Moses and Aaron the priest when they counted the Israelites in the desert of Sinai. In other words, in chapter 1 through 4 for the, in the first census, right? The 603,550 that we've already talked about. So starting in verse 65 again, for the Lord had told those Israelites they would surely die in the wilderness and not one of them was left except Caleb, son of Jephunneh and Joshua, son of Nun. So this second census is a signpost to us, just like the first census was. It tells us that Israel will soon enter the promised land. And its purpose is the same as the first census, to take stock of the military power of Israel and for allocation of the land when they enter the promised land. So this marks the end, right, of the process of killing off the first generation. And it means that 
entrance into the promised land is imminent. So what does this have to do with us? The biggest thing, I think, is that we can't just assume that we are being faithful because we are part of the community chosen by God. Or in other words, you can't assume that you are going to be the one that enters the promised land just because you're, you go to church or just because you, know, you are part of a community that worships God. Remember, of the 603,550 men in the original census, above 20, only two were faithful. Everyone else decided to follow the crowd and not trust in God's promises, not trust in God's ability to fight for them in the land of Canaan, and not trust that God would be faithful. This is a pretty sobering thing, and it's actually something that we see throughout scriptures, the scripture that whenever we talk about salvation and who will be saved in the end, it's always a remnant. The majority normally get it wrong. And so Jesus asked the same question. He's asked, you know, will those who are saved be, be many or few? And Jesus answers point blank. He says few. And, it, you know, in another place he says, you know, Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and narrow is the gate that leads to life. And we have to take this to heart. And Paul actually applies this story, the story of numbers that we've been talking about, in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. So I think the biggest application for us is, is to read Paul and to do what he says. So this is Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were all drinking from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. But God was not pleased with most of them, for they were cut down in the wilderness. These things happen as examples for us, so that we will not crave evil things as they did. So do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And let us not be immoral, as some of them were. And 23,000 died. In a single day. And let us not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by snakes. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written for our instruction, on whom the ends of the ages have come. So let the one who thinks he is standing be careful that he does not fall. No trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear. But with the trial, but with the trial will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. So Verse 12, right, I think is the big application for us. And this is, this is his application, right, his kind of conclusion. So let the one who thinks he is standing be careful that he does not fall. Those people who were redeemed, right, out of Egypt, out of bondage, they sang God's praises in Exodus 15. And they quickly turned aside and were unfaithful. Even in Exodus 16, they began to complain. And they all died in the wilderness. And they didn't enter the promised land. And God was not pleased with them. And so the same applies for us. 
we have to continue to be faithful and we have to continue to, to follow God, even when other people around us might not be and might be telling us that we don't have to go to such extremes, right? That's what was being told to Caleb and Joshua. And Caleb and Joshua said, no, we're going to be faithful to the end. You know, we're going to follow God with everything we have. So next, we come to the allocation of the land. Specifically, with the story of the daughters of Zelophad, who complain about not being able to get the land with the laws that are provided currently, right? And so really this is part of the same kind of overall picture, right? We're preparing to enter the land. And it is coupled with the next story, right, of Moses not entering the land and Joshua succeeding him, right? And again, this tells us that God really cares about, about holiness because even Moses won't enter because he was not as faithful to God as he should have been. And so both of these examples are, there are examples to us in two different ways, right? The allocation of the land is, is a promise, right? It's, it's showing that God is faithful to the good promises that that he makes to his people, right? And then we also see that God is faithful to the not so good promises, right? That, like we've already seen, Moses is not going to enter the land. God said he's not going to enter, and God says, I'm not going to change my mind. You're not going to enter. And so both of these tell us that God is, God is faithful to what he says he's going to do. And finally, we have a very similar thing with the burnt offerings um, or the, the, the offerings right at their appointed times. So this is Numbers 28 and 29. And this is the last passage in the parsha. And what we see is the primary concern in this passage, right, is that the national sacrifices are to be performed every single day and it gives the numbers of every single day that these sacrifices are to be performed and just like the allotment of the land this serves as a promise this is what a commentator gordon wenham says about about this passage every year in fu- in future in the future the priests will have to sacrifice 113 bulls 32 rams and 1,086 lambs and offer more than a ton of flour and a thousand bottles of oil and wine. Clearly, Israel is destined to be a prosperous agricultural community. These laws about sacrifices then contribute to the note of triumph that grows ever louder as the border of Canaan is reached. So again, it might seem random, right? Why, why do we have these laws? Why are we talking about allotment of land? Why do we have these laws about sacrifice here, right? Well, it's because this would give the people the hope that they would need to, to enter the land, right? And conquer the, the Canaanites who were there, right? To do what God had commissioned them to do. If they're going to be sacrificing more than a ton of flour and over a thousand lambs a year, they have to be prosperous, right? And, and so God says, look, I'm going to provide. I'm, I'm going to provide so much that you're going you're gonna to be sacrificing tons and tons of food, right, to me. And so this is an incredible promise to, to the people in, within the law itself. So to conclude, right, this last section, what does this have to do with us? Even after 
all the rebellions against God. He's still faithful at the very end of Numbers to his good promises to those who are faithful to him. And so we too can be confident of an incredible inheritance if we remain faithful. As John writes at the end of Revelation in 21, 6 through 7, this is what he says. He also said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water free of charge from the spring of the water of life. To the one who conquers, the one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So this is where we are now in the story, right? We are looking forward to that day when if we can conquer here, if we can fight the fight against evil that we need to fight in this world, both within ourselves and within the community, then we will be the ones who conquer and inherit the water of life, the tree of life, and we will be God's people, and, he, and we will be children to him. So let us all press on to know the Lord, to conquer our sin, to fight for love, and to show unrelenting mercy and grace. Or in other words, let us be who we were made to be, a kingdom of priests who display the goodness of God to the world.